Good evening. Welcome to Products That Count New York City, the October edition. We're here um, to welcome Josh, who's going to be talking tonight. But before we do that, let's just uh, really quickly, who has been to a Products That Count event before? That's really awesome. Thank you. Um, who did not hear about Products That Count until, obviously, this talk? All right. Well, <laughs> products that, it's a mix. So products that count, just really quickly, is a community of about over 18,000 product managers, innovators, engineers, designers, et cetera. Um, we started in San Francisco and then um, expanded to London, and now we're in New York City. It's um, a wonderful community. We have a newsletter. We have uh, podcasts. We have monthly speaker series. So really rich content to help the community. Um, so if you haven't signed up for our newsletters letter yet, please do. But um, it's, it's definitely something worth checking out. Um, and then before we get started with Josh, I just wanted to thank our lovely, lovely uh, host here, D Digital Ocean. Thank you so much for having us. Um, responsible for the beer, the wine, the food. Uh, it's always nice to uh, it's always nice to be here. Alrighty. Well, I'm going to introduce Josh, who is our speaker tonight. He is the North American lead for um, TransferWise. Previously, he was at Seamless. We're very excited to have him talking about a very, very relevant uh, topic for all of us, uh, which is building products with distributed teams. Welcome, Josh. Thanks for having me. Can everybody hear me all right? Yes. OK, cool. Uh, so today, I'm going to be talking about building products with distributed teams. So. Uh, if everybody could raise your hand if you work with more than three team members in your current team. Okay, most of you, right? Uh, raise your hand if you work with someone in another office in the US. Okay? And raise your hand if you work with someone in another time zone or another country. Okay, so good. We got the right audience for this type of talk. Um, so I think in, in any of those cases, you know, as a company grows, whether you're 10 people, 100 people, 1,000 people, um, as your company grows and grows, uh, it, it becomes difficult to like, keep track of everything and have context to know how to build your products. And you can't be everywhere uh, at, at every single moment, right? especially when you have people in other time zones or other offices. And so today's talk, Hopefully, you'll take away from this a few kind of tips and tricks on how you can approach product management and, and just building products with your teams uh, in a way where you don't actually need to be in every place uh, at every moment. So a little bit of uh, background on TransferWise for those of you who might not have heard of us. Uh, TransferWise is a new way of moving money around the world. Uh, and we're trying to solve this real customer problem of making, move, sending and receiving money internationally really cheap, really fast, uh, really accessible for everyone in the world. The, you know, the old banking system is super slow. It's super expensive. Uh, and, and we want to solve that. And um, we're, we started from two people in Estonia. Uh, our two co-founders came up with this idea. And we've now grown to over 700 employees uh, across the globe. And we have nine offices at TransferWise. We're in Singapore, Tokyo, the UK, New York. Um, so it's a lot of different people working on building this like, very big product. And uh, we're moving over $2 billion every month uh, and saving people a lot of money compared to their banks and other services they, that they might typically use. And the, the whole way that TransferWise worked out well is we built this uh, through autonomous teams being empowered to build things. And, and kind of the question that might bring up is, you know, 700 people, nine offices, like so many different time zones. Singapore is 12 hours opposite of, uh, of New York. Like, how do you actually make that work? Um, and to give an example, or maybe to take a step back, uh, it's, it's good to look at how companies are classically set up and how companies classically make decisions. So does this look familiar to anyone, this type of org structure? Uh, so as you can see, lots of unhappy people at the bottom. Uh, but basically, the, the classic way a company is set up is decisions kind of move their way up from the bottom to the top. So the bigger a decision is, the higher up someone needs to make that decision. So let's say we have our two friendly engineers here. They have an idea of something they want to build. They need to get their engineering lead to approve that or to make a decision on that, right? And that, that's stopping them from being able to make an impact or, or move fast. Or if it's a much bigger decision, like what is the thing we're going to build this quarter or we're going to really focus uh, five people on building this month, maybe that has to go to your PM. And 
as product managers, you can often get stuck in the middle, get really worried, you feel like you're a bottleneck. And as your teams grow locally and as they grow across the globe, you're gonna always become more and more of a bottleneck for making decisions, and there's gonna be a point where you have too many decisions to make, and maybe you're not the best person to actually be making those decisions. So some of the decisions that can come up or come to play when you're in a local office and your local team is growing, right? Uh, you, don't, you don't face that problem of not being able to communicate because of time zone difference and stuff, but you still might have a lot of different things that are coming to your plate. So an engineer asks, what should I develop next? What's next on the backlog? Why isn't the backlog, you know, the backlog isn't groomed. We need more ideas, we need more stuff to build. Um, a designer asks, is this design the right approach? Can you approve this? Is the X button to close this modal the right approach or should it be something else? Do we do a drop down? do we do radio buttons? Uh, or just someone asking, do you agree or disagree with this approach? And they're waiting for you to make those decisions. And I know I myself in, in, in past roles have ended up in a scenario where I felt like I was spending my entire day figuring out which of these decisions to focus on. And I'm not even having an impact because I'm spending all my time trying to figure out what I should spend my time on, which sounds really weird, but I, th I think it resonates with some of you. Um, and then this problem gets even worse when you get distributed teams across the globe. You know, while you're sleeping, you're getting your much needed beauty rest as, as all product managers really need. Uh, there's a lot of decisions that are just waiting for you across, across the pond that, that are essentially just blocked. So you have, you know, another team is thinking about building something. They want to avoid the, the fact that maybe they're going to be doubling up on the same work or solving a solution that, uh, that maybe your team is already solving. They're going to need to wait that 8 to 12 hours for you to wake up or check Slack in the middle of the night and say like, oh yeah, we're building that, or no, we're not. You guys should start on it. But every minute that passes is a minute you're not impacting customers' lives and, and really driving forward with your business. Um, a-B testing is another great one. You know, product managers are often responsible for analyzing data, making decisions on do we go live or not, at least in classic organizations. And again, that is potentially days or weeks where you're having all this back and forth talking about results where if you weren't the person who needed to make that decision, you could be impacting customers today. Um, or someone in CS has a really important question and you're not even awake to help them answer and they don't know where to go and they can't make a decision. Maybe that means an angry customer and as PMs, trying to empathize with the customers, trying to be that consumer voice. If you're preventing customers from having a happy time, you're gonna have a bad time, your team's gonna have a bad time, it's gonna be a bad time. Um, so something we like to say at TransferWise and I think we take to heart in everything we do is the person closest to the problem is best placed to solve it. And what this really means is, you know, as your team's growing, you have less and less context of individual decisions you can make or how to solve an exact problem, why not empower people that are much closer to that problem to make decisions and make an impact on that? They're gonna know, your engineers are gonna know so much more about the technical solution they're building or how they're going to build it because they're the ones building it. They're so much closer to it and it makes sense that they should be able to make decisions and be empowered to do that. Um, and I think if you can find ways to let those closer, those closest to problems actually be able to help solve them, you could, make a lot more impact and you can save yourself a lot of time because you don't need to be making those decisions or doing those things. So a better option, uh, or at least a better option that we at TransferWise think about is uh, autonomous teams. And the way we're set up at TransferWise is every team at TransferWise is almost like a mini startup. So we're a group of cross-functional team members. You know, we have engineers, designers, CS, everybody we need to build a really great product. And we organize ourselves around different customer problems. So making it much easier to verify customers to say who they say they are and we can keep their money safe. Or payment processing, making payments moving to and from the US as fast as possible for our customers. And these teams, since they act like startups, they make decisions within their own teams. They decide what are the metrics we're trying to move, what are the priorities that we're solving. And since they're empowered to do that, you don't waste time going up and down the chain trying to make decisions or catch people up or bring them into context. Um, and our leadership team uh, acts more like an advisory board. So instead of always needing to go to the leadership team to make decisions or to get direction, the teams are driving that direction, the teams are making those decisions, and they can lean on this advisory board to point them in the right direction, maybe give them advice from their past experiences or things they're seeing across the company that, that you can apply better in your own teams. And now not everybody has the luxury of working at like a super flat uh, autonomous organization. So you, know, you might be asking yourself, well, I maybe am more in that classic org style. 
how can I have more impact with my distributed teams when we don't have a completely autonomous culture? Um, and one of the first things you can do is start with your company's mission. So every company should have a mission. And if your company doesn't have a mission, I'd question what you're even doing there or what they're building. Uh, but most companies have a mission, right? They know over time what they want to build and what they're ultimately trying to achieve. Uh, and that mission is a great thing that you can use to align a lot of your different team members behind what you're building. Everything that your team builds, everything you focus on as a PM, as an engineer, as a recruiter, it doesn't matter, is ultimately playing into reaching that mission, right? The mission is a long, long ways away. But knowing where you're headed, you know, people often say PMs help to steer the ship or point, point the team in the right direction. They're not rowing the oars, but they're pointing the team in the right direction. And if your team doesn't even know where your company's mission is, how are they knowing where to row? How are they knowing where to steer the ship? Um, so for example, this is TransferWise's mission. So our mission is money without borders, instant, convenient, transparent, and eventually free. We're powering money for people and businesses to pay, to get paid, to spend in any currency, wherever you are, whatever you're doing. And there's no team that currently works at TransferWise that is not building something that gets us closer to this vision every day, this mission every day. Um, and it makes it a lot easier for us to make decisions in our in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, and as a PM, you know, when our team talks about what are we ultimately building, what are the KPIs we focus on, we always turn back to this mission and say, is what we're doing getting us closer to here? Because if it's not, then it's not something that's going to help us, our customers, and our business. The second thing you can do is paint out your product vision. Uh, and a lot of people are like, what, what is a product vision? I, want, I like painting. I don't get to do enough art. I'm in Excel all day. Uh, and a product vision is essentially, if you look into the future, you, use your, your future telling skills, um, what does your product ideally look like in the future? This could be in two years' time. It could be five years' time, et cetera. But you as a product manager are in a really unique position to know strategically where do you want the product to go in the future. You have inputs from lots of different teams. Uh, you've worked on innovating your product day in and day out. But you know ultimately where do you want that product to be. And if you're able to clearly paint that product vision for your team, again, they can all get aligned behind it. And you have to let, worry less and less about the details and the individual things that build up to that. So an exercise you guys can all do, and I, I encourage you to try this with your teams uh, when you go, when you leave this thing today, is Take like five team members. It could be like marketing, engineering, whatever, and ask them, where do you think our products, whatever product you're building, where do you think our product will be a year from now? And if you ask five different people, you'll, you might be surprised to get five very different answers. And I think that goes to show that like, hey, people don't actually know where the product is supposed to be headed. And as a product manager, that's one of the things you can have the most impact with is trying to show here's where the product should be headed, here's how we're getting closer to reaching our company's mission. So this is an example that, of our team, how we talk about our, company, uh, our product vision in North America, which kind of is semi-related to our company mission. It's about sending money and getting paid in North America is seamless on any platform for people and businesses. It's the cheapest option, and customers trust their money arrives the same day they sent it with our fail-safe system. And this resonates a lot with our team, and they know how to make decisions to get closer to this vision. But this also is kind of derived from our larger company mission. So if we're able to accomplish this vision, we're helping TransferWise as a whole ultimately reach uh, our mission of instant, eventually free transfers around the world. Another thing that this one might seem like common sense, uh, but not everyone necessarily follows this to, the, to its fullest extent, is hire smart people and trust them. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have been involved in hiring or have been interviewed, uh, have gone through a hiring process. Hiring is really expensive. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of energy. Uh, it takes a lot of people to make happen. And for the most part, I think people are good at hiring smart people. It would be weird if you weren't hiring smart people or people you thought were smart. But the part I think a lot of companies and, and even like PMs in, in their day-to-day -day lives fall short in is actually trusting them. You know, you've, you've hired engineers who've come from great backgrounds, have worked in lots of different companies, and come with all this experience, why not trust them to make day-to-day -day decisions? You know, I think we'd be kidding ourselves if we thought product management was rocket science. We all come from different varying backgrounds. And the decision we try to make and the way we try to steer our teams is some of those decisions are things individual contributors can make, too. So we should trust them to do those, to do those things. And a way we look at this in our teams, uh, or kind of like a, a 
a rule we follow is that everyone has an equal voice. You often hear the, the phrase product heroes. You know, it, when you look at teams, in, especially in larger organizations, everybody's always turning to the product manager to say, well, I don't know, what does the PM think? Like, does Josh agree with this? Because if Josh doesn't say yes, it's not going to happen. And at TransferWise, everyone has an equal voice. And I think even in your own orgs, you can make this happen. Um, try to be less of a PM that's seen as a hero or the one who always needs to make the decisions. Kind of break that, break that expectation that the PM always needs to be the one to make a decision or to have a voice because then your engineers, the people in customer support, everyone else who's helping you to build the product, they get further away from having to fight just to be heard, to get their opinions heard. And they're actually expected to be an active part in deciding what we build, adding rationale, figuring out are we maximizing our impact. And if you kind of break that stigma of the PM is, is the only person who makes that decision, it's going to help you be a lot more effective in your team. And you'll find that with your distributed team members, the ones who are you know, six, eight, nine hours away, they're going to be a lot more comfortable saying, I feel confident backing this up, making this impact, because I know my voice is just as equal as everyone else. And then another great benefit is, especially people who often are seen as not having a voice at all in an organization, like customer support, operational roles, uh, people who are typically you know, on the front lines making your product work day in and day out, they have so much trouble, especially in larger organizations, getting their voice heard. But if you show them that their voice can be heard and their opinions matter and they can influence the product roadmap just as much as you can or an engineer can, you're going to get a ton more insights and you're going to be able to leverage those relationships with, with your support team uh, to make a great product that's going to help out people. And we actually we take this to an even further extent where like, we have customer support uh, folks who attend like our daily stand-ups and our, our weekly plannings when we're figuring out what to build because we want to make sure that their voice is heard. Uh, another thing you can do is agree on metrics as a team. So in the classic org styles, right, uh, metrics are often handed down. right? It's like the board wants us to reach this much revenue or get this many MNUs, and individual teams, it says, OK, your KPIs are blah. You're trying to hit this many X MNUs, et cetera. And it, it's not very helpful for the team because they're not motivated to hit those metrics because they weren't a part of making up those uh, or coming up with what those indicators of success were uh, in the first place. Um, I'm not sure if anybody's heard about the acronym SMART, but they say SMART metrics are good metrics. And more often than not, when uh, metrics are handed down and the team hasn't actually agreed on them, maybe it's like a PM and a tech lead have come up with the metrics, but haven't actually involved the people who are building the product, they're not very smart. So for example, uh, relevant, this is a great one. There are a lot of teams that are, someone hands them a, a handful of KPIs and metrics and says, hey team, these are the metrics you need to drive. And they're totally not relevant to what the team is building or what they ultimately can impact on the product. Or maybe they're not relevant to the vision of the product that, that you as a team have painted or even the company's mission, right? And I think if a metric isn't relevant, it's not gonna help you and people aren't gonna be motivated to move it. Um, another one, time bound, right? Often people are like, move this many MNUs, and they either give completely unrealistic timelines or no timelines at all. And I think if the team knows how they're going to impact those KPIs and at what level they're going to impact them and over what time period, they're going to feel a lot more motivated and, and be aligned behind it. And then you're going to have to spend a lot less time being the person who says, guys, I pulled the data. Here's the KPIs. Here's what we have to drive. And you'll switch to the point where individual contributors on your team are being passionate about moving those KPIs, about making a real impact, because you agreed on them together. Uh, coach others to be product heroes. So in product management, there's a lot of different skill sets that, that we have that we can add value to a team with, whether it's gaining user insights, maybe digging really deep into data, uh, trying to do predictive modeling and figure out what the best where, where things can have impact. Um, but these are things that you can teach others to do as well. You know, if you're not able to be in, again, every place at, at, at one time, um, if you're not there to help out with user insights, that's going to be those six, nine hours or days that people are going without user insights. But there's no reason why you can't actually coach others to do those things. So for example, you know, a classic, classic thing that happens in a lot of organizations is someone in customer support messages you on Slack, and they say, hey, there's this bug. It's a huge bug. I think it's a huge bug. It's, customers are calling us. It's like terrible. We need to fix it. And you say, all right, I'm going to put on my PM data hat. I'm going to like open up Looker. I'm going to look at like Google Analytics, Mixpanel. I'm going to figure out, like, is this bug 
really going to have impact if we solve it. And you'll spend that time, and you'll figure it out, and you'll figure out its priorities and where it fits in. Um, but I think there's a missed opportunity there. You're already doing that analysis, and you're going through those steps. Why not show that person in support how you actually pulled that data? How did you approach understanding that problem and quantifying it, right? Because uh, you know, your customer support teams, they, they may not have that skill set, and they don't know how to have a stronger voice at the table to say, this is something that can have real impact. So if you can teach your customer support team how to pull data, how to show impact of projects, it goes from, hey, Josh, I have a bug. I think it's important to, hey, Josh, I found this issue. It's going to reduce contact rate by 3%. And that makes your, it saves you one a lot of time, but it also makes your decision making and your, your prioritization a lot easier as a team because you have people who are, who are thinking those things and making those decisions. Another example, uh, which we try to do a lot at TransferWise is let engineers lead some of the conversation, right? You, you have so many times, and even I'm guilty of this from time to time, where you know, you're presenting your quarterly plans for the quarter to the rest of the organization, or maybe you're, you're doing a talk or a blog post or something, and it's usually the PM that's like the one who's like the face of the team, the one who's explaining it and rationalizing why are we building what we're building, what's the impact it's going to have, kind of pre preaching that what the team's doing up to upper management. And, and as well, from a prioritization standpoint, right? It's, it's usually the PM saying, these are the priorities, this is the order we got to solve it in, and here's how we're going to do it. But try flipping the rules for once. Instead of during a planning say, hey guys, these are the five most important things in the backlog, ask your engineers, tell the rest of the team what you guys think the highest impact things are and why. And you can help them to really hone those rationale and data pulling skills so that they feel a lot more confident in saying, this is an important thing I want to work on, and I'm passionate about it, and it's going to make a real impact on us reaching that product vision and ultimately our company's mission. Um, and have them do presentations as well. You know, engineers are spending a lot of time uh, coding in the details, but they want to be able to flex their public speaking abilities. Again, being able to rationalize what, why they're working on what is uh, is important. So when you're doing a demo or talking about something to the to a wider audience, to another team, to your management. Uh, to your marketing teams, et cetera. Had the engineers do that, they built the thing, right? Like, they, they should feel confident and, and feel proud of what they built and, and be able to talk about it. And the last one uh, I'd highlight is getting people to empathize more with users. There are, are a lot of people you might deal with in product management that are a few steps away from the users. And one example that we run into at TransferWise is people in compliance and legal, right? They're often heads down, dealing with regulators, reading through very complex laws that none of us necessarily want to read or have the time to read. And when you're talking to them about certain things in your product, I think oftentimes compliance and legal can be seen as putting up walls or fences to your product. It's, oh, that's not compliant. That's too risky. That's not legal. And you spend a lot of time trying to get them to understand, here's where the customers are coming from. Here's the core customer problem. Or maybe here's a way of approaching it from a user-focused uh, standpoint. Um, so why not teach people in those roles who are typically three steps away from the user, bring them a step closer, maybe have them do a side-by-side -side with someone in customer support and actually talk to customers face-to-face. -face. They're going to be able to empathize so much more with the problems that customers are going through. Or if you run a user testing session, you're going through a flow and you're trying to make a decision on how to handle something from a legal or a compliance standpoint, if that person's involved in that user testing, they see how users feel, they see how you think about getting into a customer's mind frame, um, they can do that in their day-to-day -day jobs. And, and ultimately, you're going to make better decisions on, on impacting your customers. Um, so yeah, to recap, I think ways you can maximize impact in your distributed teams is start with your mission. You know, take your company's great mission and preach about it. Paint that product vision. Show people where your product should be headed uh, and, and get them on board. And, and make it so that the next time you ask those five people where is the product headed in a year, you're going to get the same answer. Hire smart people and trust them. Empower people to make decisions that they are totally capable of making and probably will make a better decision than you can. Uh, agree on metrics as a team. Make sure that they're smart. Make sure that what you're driving is actually making an impact on the business and driving the mission. And coach others to be product heroes. Um, and yeah, uh, we are hiring. So if you like the way that we work, you can always check out transferwise.com slash jobs to see uh, jobs we're talking about. And uh, thanks. That's my talk. Yeah. Uh, so 
Uh, hi, Jess. So how do you manage like the cultural shock between these various locations for like distributed teams? Yeah, so I think uh, cu cultural shock or cultural differences is something we run into a lot. You know, uh, we have on our team, we have Estonians, Ukrainians, people from the UK, people from Australia, many different cultures and backgrounds. And I think one thing is we try to spend as much time as we can face to face. I think that helps you to break a lot of cultural barriers by spending time together, getting to know each other, having a beer or playing ping pong with, with someone, becoming more friendly. That can help to open up some of those maybe communication style differences. Um, and I think as well, you know, especially in the, in the day and age of things like Slack, where a lot can be lost over translation. If someone sends a direct message and you're like, Ooh, did they? Maybe that came off a little like too too crass, or or I interpret that wrong. Just be open and transparent with each other. I think so many issues in companies come down to people not just being open and honest with each other. And I think again, if it comes back to you guys all having an equal voice and trusting each other, you're gonna feel comfortable saying, "Hey, I don't. I, I feel like we have this tension going on, or I don't understand the way you're approaching this." And maybe you find it's oh, that's just that's the way it is in our culture. Or this is how we approach it, and that that can be a way that. Maybe you, you help to get over some of those divides. Based on, do you, based on that, do you guys do a lot of video chat? Yeah, so we, we video chat a lot. We spend a lot of time on Google Hangouts. Um, but I do think it makes like a really big difference actually being able to see each other face to face. Another thing TransferWise does is we we get everybody together once a year to, to kind of celebrate as a company uh, in, in Estonia. Um, so we all get together, we hang out with each other, you get to have fun, take a, take a break away from work. And I think when you can do things like that, whether it's just within your own team, like it makes such a, such a huge difference. Because I know I've gone from being introduced to someone over Slack and thinking like, oh, we, like, we are not going to get along. There's a lot of like, conflict here. Maybe there's a lot of cultural difference. Like this, guy, this person doesn't like me at all. And then you like, actually see them in person and meet them, and it's totally fine. But I think definitely video chat and, and actually seeing people's faces matter a lot, too. I think like stand-ups, a lot of people don't necessarily make the time to do stand-ups. They'll, they'll have a Slack bot that like, automatically posts, <laughs> what are you where are you blocked, what are you doing, blah, blah, blah. But I think it's so important to actually just see each other's faces every day. Um, and I know there have been like some apps that have tried to solve that, but I think like you know just hop on hop on the chat just to see each other, say hi, be friendly. Um, I think that matters quite a bit. Hey Josh, I don't know if the organization behaved that way once you got there. Can you talk a little bit about how you got from point A to point B and everybody's behavior? Yeah, so I think a key part. I mean, I've only been in Transferwise for two years, so point A was even like a long time before. But I can talk about my point A to my point B. Uh, so I think a key part of it definitely in the organization is the culture of TransferWise. Like we, the values at TransferWise that we have um, as employees of TransferWise and everybody from our CEO down to individual people in product teams like live and breathe these values that are about be transparent, empower people, uh, people closest to the problem should make uh, should make decisions on them and are best poised to solve it. So I think the way your company's culture is organized around that sort of stuff ma matters a lot. And then even if you're not able to maybe shift the culture of your entire company, you can start with your own team. So something we did when I started at TransferWise was we started inviting our customer support and operations team members to our plannings just to kind of like get them in the know, get them involved, and slowly over time, it like definitely doesn't happen overnight. Um, but try to chip away and iterate on those ways that you can get people more involved. So maybe you start with that last point of trying to coach someone who's in a non-product role to pull data. And just start with that and like work on that, see how that works, and see if it eventually resonates. And it could be different for every organization, right? Like everybody's set up differently. But I think doing it through your own team's culture and then also try to shift the company culture eventually to some of these things can, I think, can make a big impact over the long run. Yeah, so the way we deal with that at TransferWise is we, we kind of have like a weak, a weak product ownership or a weak code ownership model where basically, you know, for example, us in the North American team, we're trying to build it so that 
sending money to and from North America is as easy and cheap as possible. Um, unless we wanted to have a custom version of TransferWise for every currency that we had on TransferWise, uh, like, which would be a nightmare from a scaling standpoint, um, it would never work. So when we're touching something that, say, is in the verification flow of how we verify customers in the US, um, when we're thinking of those solutions, when we actually build those solutions, we'll reach out to that verification team and maybe have them do code reviews for us. Or it, a lot of it's just about transparency and communication of like, hey, here's the problem we're trying to solve. Here's how we're approaching it, how it might impact what you're working on. And between like definitely like geo-focused teams, like my, my team that's like doing North America and a team that's maybe more centrally based like verification, you through that like feedback and talking back and forth, you might realize that you're trying to solve a problem in one way, but when they're looking at it from a central standpoint, there's a way you can shift that to actually make it apply to many more uh, regions or, or many, it can just scale better. And I think that's something we try to do every day is like when we're solving problems, try to find a way that if it impacts something cross-functionally, how do we build it in such a way that it can impact 3x the customers versus just for our little market so we're not siloed and, and kind of going off on a tangent. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah definitely. So at, at the end of the day, we, we try not to like get in any situations where like a team has to approve or thumbs up something you're doing. Your, your team ultimately does have autonomy for that. But I think it, you wouldn't end up in that many scenarios if you're communicating openly and honestly and talking about like the motivations of, of the problems you're trying to solve that you would end up in a situation where you're going to make a call to build something that a team is like very, very against. Um, and I, I think the key there is just talking about what's the customer problem you're trying to solve, uh, what are their worries, why do they not want you to approach it in a certain way. But again, if, if your team is able to go in and iterate on that code and, and they can be evolved just in a code review, I mean, teams are so much more happy to say, hey, you want to make verification better, but we don't have to build anything? Perfect. Like, let's just make sure it doesn't screw up the system as a whole. Um, and, and I think that works really well. I don't know if it'll work at every organization, but it definitely does the way, the way that we're set up. How do, you, how do you manage meetings between the team in Singapore and the team in New York? So definitely, like really, really far, uh, really, really far time differences are are really hard, uh, especially for something like Singapore. I think our mornings in in the New York office are very, very hectic because it's like the time that you can maximize overlap with our offices in Estonia and in the UK. Um, and I think, I think the key there is, well, one, finding what meetings are actually effective to have. I actually try to maximize as much as I can, and I could probably do an even better job of this, of like just spending time with the team and, and doing the things that helps to unblock them the most or helps to go through some of those things like coaching them, uh, pointing them in the right direction, making the vision clearer. Um, so I think... I think a good way to approach that, especially when you're in such distributed teams, is like if there's anything in those core crossover like time periods of the day, really, really question like, is this meeting necessary? Is this meeting necessary for this time of day? Um, I think another thing which almost plays back into the cultural question is like, uh, which I I've learned over the course of working at TransferWise is we have a lot of coworkers in Estonia and Estonians are a lot quieter than Americans, which probably isn't a surprise because there is that stigma around Americans always talking and being, and being loud. Uh, and so there, like when you're talking over video chat or something, you want to make sure you give people the opportunity to talk, to have an opinion. Um, and also know that like, oh, it's 5.30 at the end of the day, their day, like understand where they're coming from and, and that maybe they're a little tired and they, they need another cup of coffee or something. Um, so kind of having that approach to meetings, I think helps it to be more effective. Sometimes there's, especially in the cross-functional teams, I have a question regarding, uh, you said that you have some uh, customer service people. Mm -hmm. uh, their goals, are they aligned with your goals? In that, say you are going after new customers, are they also going after new customers, or are they still considered a cost center so they need to manage expenses? Because in those cases, the healthy tension is so good yeah. that um, I guess, how do you manage the healthy tension but then still support the autonomous decision making? Yeah, so the, the way we've handled it is um, we, 
we have what we call like CS champions. So making sure, because the one thing we noticed when we first started pulling in uh, people from customer support and operational roles, when you just pulled them into product, they would always be doing that balancing act of like, how am I making sure to actually you know, answer enough calls, like respond to emails, respond to chats, and be enough involved in the product? And it was kind of like, one or the other, you can never do both effectively. So by having like CS champions, we have folks in those roles who are kind of like dedicated to helping out uh, with product and also spreading that word and that knowledge across their team and collecting that knowledge. So a lot of our customer support team uh, at TransferWise uh, North America is based in Tampa, Florida. So we're not there every single week. Uh, but by having a champion who's well connected to the product, I think that helps to, to kind of pass around that healthy tension. And the other thing, which goes back to the, the point about like, what are your team's metrics? We make like costs and driving down contacts a key metric of, of the teams that like CS is heavily involved in. So I think there you can find kind of a shared avenue forward versus it feeling like, oh, this is something that's gonna bring on a lot of new people, but is also gonna cause volume, call volumes to go up. Um, and having CS in the room to kind of balance out that perspective. Because there's been some times where we've, we've gone to build something or thought of building something, and it's like, oh, that's great in, in practicality, but we would never be able to support it uh, from a call volume standpoint or, or an email volume standpoint. So I think through some of that conversation and, and having those aligned things can really help out. There's a question in the back. Can you paint a little bit more context in terms of the number of decisions made maybe per day? Um, and is there sort of a threshold where you can't hit this number or otherwise it's going to be too chaotic, there's too many moving variables and stuff like that? Yeah, I think, uh, are you saying in terms of like you as a PM, like how many de decisions or is too many? Or? Everybody else makes. OK, um, I mean, I think, I think at the end of the day, if your metrics are moving in the right direction, and you feel like you're no longer being a bottleneck, maybe it's like the number of Slack messages you're getting or, or something like that. Um, I think you know you're heading in the right direction. I don't think there is a key specific number that some team should or shouldn't be making. And some can happen silently as well, right? Where say, uh, engineers on our team, like they're making hundreds of decisions every day. Maybe some of those would have normally bubbled up Depend, and it depends on the individual person as well, right? Like how confident are they or how empowered are they in making those decisions? So I think, I think if what your team builds ultimately gets you closer to that product vision, it's moving the metrics that you guys agreed on, um, that's, that would be the way to know that you're really headed in the right direction. And you'll, you'll know even just based off of like your, however you do your sprint plannings or whatever it is, you'll know in the way that the team talks about what they should be building or why they're building it or stuff that happened in the last sprint um, you'll see some of that stuff start to come to fruition you, where you'll realize, oh, maybe I'm a step away from that stuff, but it's still ending up in the right, the right area. And then you also, as a PM, I think another way to measure it is like, are you spending time on the stuff that you can have the most impact with as a PM? So maybe instead of spending most of your time organizing a backlog in JIRA, you're spending that much more time talking to customers, uh, researching competitors, doing some of these things that maybe people who are building the product and are, are in, in the details don't necessarily have time to do or are in the best position to do. You talked about how you can coach others to be more autonomous on your team. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, how, what are some of the ways that they coach you? Um, what are some of the things that you take on offsetting some of that um, you know, efficiency that you're creating and, and removing that bottleneck? What, what do you take on to, to then make them more efficient? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. Uh, so there's a lot I learned from my team. I think it's the reason why I love coming to work every day, because I learned so much from everybody uh, in, in my organization. The one, the one big area that, that you get feedback is just how they think about and approach problems. And I think the interesting one with this is like when they're making a tough decision or they're making a trade-off, understanding from an engineer's stand, uh, point of view, like, how is that engineer making that trade-off? Maybe they understand something about the technical complexity that you would have never thought of, or they're thinking about the long-term vision of the API or the scalability of your platform that you, you would have never thought of, and now you've taken that, you've learned it, and you can use that to teach each other. Um, and it really depends on the, the individual skill of each person. So I learn a lot from my coworkers on the way that they look at data, maybe different ways to interpret problems. Uh, maybe ways that competitors are touching stuff. So it's, an, it's a whole handful of things, but I think those are some of the key examples for me. How do you, 
How do you guys manage risk uh, globally? Because you have clients, whether it be in the fintech space, mm -hmm. uh, startups, even you might even have traditional bank clients. Like I came from, I was telling you, I used to be a key person at JP Morgan mm -hmm. in the hedge fund space. So I had global <laughs> hedge fund clients who did business all over the world, 24 hours a day. Their biggest thing was risk and minimizing that risk. If you're saying part of your mission is impact, given all the mm -hmm. problems we're having, especially in the United States right now, with cybersecurity mm -hmm. and hacking from foreign adversaries and entities, how are you guys managing that risk? And how are you helping your clients to get up to speed on the latest technology mm -hmm to help minimize a negative impact if they do if they are breached. So we definitely like security and keeping customers money safe is like at the core of the mission of Transferwise. We wouldn't be able to send money and make it available to everyone around the world if it wasn't safe. So we we put a lot of effort and and prioritization on that stuff. Um, we also work a lot on building out our infrastructure to be automated, to use things like machine learning to check for, we have teams dedicated to looking for fraud and any money laundering and some of this other stuff to keep customers' money safe. And we're, we're very open and honest and transparent when we're working with partners around the world about how we're compliant, how we're working with regulators, how we're keeping people's money safe. And we actually, we even work a lot with, uh, with different legal entities and stuff to actually change the laws in some countries that can better protect customers' money. So, for example, in uh, Singapore, the way you used to have to verify your identity was by going in person and showing an ID. So every person in the country of Singapore, when they wanted to get verified to send money online, they had to drive, show an ID, and maybe if they had faked the ID or do something, it was all down to that individual agent's uh, ability to say, hey, is this safe? And we were able to shift that showing some of the ways we think about and we use like predictive technology and, and image analysis and stuff to say, hey, this, this document that's been uploaded is legit. It's, it is who they say they are based off of all this recent data, where their IP address is, all these different things, which ultimately we helped show the regulator that doing this online and doing it through new technology is actually going to keep people safer. It's going to prevent things like identity theft and fraud. Um, and so we're always looking for ways to, to improve at that and, and partner with like the, the old world technology versus saying that's broken, we're just going to ignore it and go our own way. I think like partnering with regulators, partnering with uh, leaders in the fintech space as well on how, how they're tackling some of these problems in their day to day is really, really important. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Um, I don't think I missed this. So, all for autonomous teams, I think it's a great concept and it sounds like it is executed quite well. Um, inevitably, when you get to a certain size, you have teams, because they're autonomous, that don't talk to each other enough. What do you do when you have these teams of three or five people, which I think is the right number of people to come to a decision and say, hey, do you think that makes sense? Okay, let's create, let's do it this way. And you have another group like that, et cetera. And there is a roadblock. And you're like, well, it made sense in the group, or we thought we thought we thought about the problems of the group, but actually there is a conflict, or that system won't work with this system or whatever. Like that seems to be the reason, not that I'm arguing for it, but the reason why bureaucracy exists so that oh we get up to the top and so therefore that doesn't happen. Now we know it doesn't always work that way, but I'm really curious because that would seem to be the biggest threat to this model. Yeah, so I think uh, I mean the root cause of that problem is just people, not the right people talking to each other there, right? So it's like they're, they're in their silo, they're in their three to five person team, and they're making that decision. And so there's a few ways that we try to mitigate this, but you know, those things can still happen. So the one thing we do at TransferWise is every team makes like the stuff that they're working on and their plans for say the quarter or for the month like super transparent. Anybody at the company can see what anybody at the company is building and why they're building it, and we also, really push for a internal coaching 
uh, cultures. So actually, you know, when our team, the North American team, came up with our plans for what we're doing for the rest of the year, we actually chose like a few people in different parts of the organization, someone in fraud, someone in finance, et cetera, to actually look at our plans and give us feedback on the decisions we're making and the trade-offs we're making. And that, one, just helps to get some outside perspective of it. But two, they can now spread the word and, and communicate better, maybe in areas where we're not able to reach every single person. So I think by more people being aware of what you're working on and also being like a little bit invested in what you're working on um, can help to avoid some of those situations. Um, I think we need to figure out as we grow as a company, like, you know, we're 700 plus now, when we're 1400 plus, you know, 2500 plus, whatever it is, um, we're going to run into new problems as we scale. But I think, again, a lot of it comes down to how we're transparent with each other, how we communicate and being honest about like, hey, these problems happen, they seem to be happening in a lot of different places, how can we solve them together? Can we do last question? Um, so you talk a, a lot about how to bring uh, like engineering team like um, uh, together, but uh, do you have any experience uh, to like what what happens if your like manager executives they are in remote uh, office or like in different countries? Like um, how, how how do you manage to bring like your managers or you know CEO C, uh, CTO together? And what, uh, what specifically is the aim of bringing them together? Is it to like let um, them know what you're working so on to get their buy-in? Yeah, I mean, so in my case, it's like uh, like our CTO like travels around uh, yeah. the, the world, so like we, we couldn't actually see. I mean, talk to him in person. Mm -hmm. So like, what what's your approach to you know to have them uh, sitting uh, together? Yeah, so I think yeah, there are a lot of companies that are. I mean, like my. My lead and my CEO don't aren't in New York, right? So it's a, it's a problem I like, or it's it's a difference that, that I face too. Um, but I think an important part, especially for like leadership team, is is they like the thing they're trying to do is trying to grow the organization, move the business forward, and reach that company mission. And so I think as a PM, a way you can get more engagement maybe with someone who's not in the same office as you, or get their opinion, get their feedback, uh, is. Try painting to them kind of like the opposite way. Hey, here's this company mission that you're leading as a CEO. This is the company mission you're preaching. Here's how our team is building things and reaching our product mission or product vision and how it's ultimately leading to that mission. I think a lot of times people are so focused in the details of like, oh, this button's being placed here or we're building this feature. But for someone who's so far removed from that, it's, it's hard to get them involved or invested. But if you're able to show through the metrics you're driving or the decisions you're making, how that ultimately plays up to the company mission, which is what they're trying to drive, I think that's a great way for you to find a connecting point. And I think that, that's been also a way that like our leadership team and our CEO at TransferWise has been able to give us helpful feedback. You know, they're able to take a step back and say, well, hang on a minute, like how does this ultimately play into the mission? Or maybe you should be thinking about this part, or this is a different way to look at it. Um, and I think if everything connects up the chain uh, from from individual feature all the way up to the company's mission, that conversation is going to be a lot easier to have. Thank you so much, Josh. Well, thank you. All right. So one other thing that we do at um, Products That Count is we do shout outs. Uh, so if you have anything you want to share, so for example, there's a job that you're hiring for. You're looking for a job. You're working on something awesome that you want to share. Uh, you're looking for users. Come on up and uh, and share. So I will go first. Um, so I'm Andrea. I head up products that count in New York City, but I also run product at One Kings Lane, which is an e-commerce uh, home furnishings company. I have openings for product roles, engineering, and some uh, and a UX researcher. So. If you know anybody who's looking, or if you guys are looking, come find me after this, and we will chat. Anybody else want to do a shout out? Let's go. Um, I'm working in a recruitment team for TransferWise New York. We're looking for um, software engineers, mobile engineers, and lots of others. So feel free to come and have a chat afterwards.
This is a shout out, but not for recruiting. We are hiring, but I was going to do a shout out more on the other business models. So um, I work at Glossier, and we're not fully distributed, which is kind of interesting. Um, it's more that we have a bit of a hub uh, as our New York is our main office. We have half or a third of our tech team in Montreal, but then a couple of remote people. And I was wondering if other people have some pros and tips for that kind of situation where people are not fully distributed. But my tip would be that it is good to become the remote office every now and then, which is to say we need to feel the pain in the New York office of what like our Manila engineer feels, of what Greensboro feels, of what Montreal feels when their sound suddenly cuts out and they don't hear anything of the co uh, conversation and they're like waving for attention. So we try to make everyone feel that pain uh, uh, like once in a while to remind each other of the empathy. So if you guys have other tips, I'm curious to uh, hear about them. Well, shout out to me feels like I should be like praising someone. I'm not really going to do that. No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, well, two things. So I'm Ross. I'm looking for a new product or potentially marketing role. Uh, so keep me in mind. Um, I've worked at MasterCard and Amex uh, of late. Uh, and otherwise, I'm curious if anyone here has also worked in any cryptocurrency or blockchain stuff, which I know is very buzzy, but a lot of people haven't worked in it. So if anyone has, I'm very curious. All right, one more shout out. Hi everyone, I'm Joseph. Uh, I'm a part of Products That Count, the community. I've been with the community four months. Um, I met Andrea this evening, but I've been in contact with SC, uh, getting more used to the different dated minded thinkers that we have. And um, I'm what you would call a creator or an innovator. I'm a former key person at JP Morgan. I spent about a decade there um, in different roles. I started out in private bank, um, went on to manage retail real estate teams, um, not-for-profit, healthcare space. But the part I enjoyed most, which you might find intriguing, is getting to know our clients intimately, especially the last five years I spent in the large corporate financial institution space. So the D. E. Shaw's of the world, the Blackstones, the Charles Schwab's, they require a lot of hand-holding and constant attention. Um, and I think Josh talked a lot about paying attention to detail and the impact that you can make. And I say all that to say is I'm a difference maker. And in certain circles, they call me the, I'm the billion dollar Wall Street banker you never heard of. But in a minute, you all are going to hear about me because I'm working on different side projects with uh, equity crowdfunding platforms, also crypto, people out in LA. Um, but I'm just here to, I told Andre I want to be a volunteer. So if you need any help, big strategy ideas, business development, enterprise level things, risk management, I'd be happy to share some contacts and experience. And I'm also in, in the market. Uh, I'm talking to different fintech and startups globally at the enterprise level. Um, so keep me in mind if you know anybody. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Um, OK, three more things, and then we'll do a quick raffle, and then I'll let you guys have more pizza and beer. So my PSA is for the evening. Uh, so three things. One. Uh, so we're all product people here. Uh, products that count, we really care about feedback. Uh, you should be receiving in your email uh, just a very short survey. Please take it. It's for us to be able to measure our NPS score. Our NPS averages about 50, which is pretty high. Um, and what we typically try to do is make a little game. We try to you know, do this for our speakers. Um, so with the average of 50, let's help Josh beat that. Uh, so take the survey. Score, score high for him. Um, score high for products that count. It does help us make our talks better, our events better, et cetera. 
second PSA. Uh, Digital Ocean recycles, so let's make sure as we enjoy the pizza, the beer, et cetera, we are throwing out um, the trash, the bottles, et cetera, accordingly. The, the, uh, uh, the, the canisters are marked. Last PSA, super fun. Our next event uh, is next month on November 15th. We are hosting the former head of product from Netflix. He's going to be talking about product strategy and leadership. His name is Gibson Biddle. Amazing, amazing speaker. So hopefully you guys can come back. We would love to have you guys here. All right. Who's ready for some raffles really quickly? Emily, will you come join me? Emily, why don't you call out one? Uh, it's 379579. To relieve all your stress. Yeah. <laughs> all right, let's do one more or two more. Josh gets one anyway. 379568. Oh, that's amazing. All right, Dan. <laughs> you do the last one. Three seven nine five eight zero. Five eight zero. Ooh, 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 ah, awesome. All right. All right. I hope you're not too stressed, but you can use it. <laughs> Thanks, Emily. All right, guys. Thank you so much. There's more pizza. There's wine. There's beer. We're here until at nine o'clock. So go talk to Josh. Come talk to me. Go mingle. And thanks so much for coming tonight.